A very good afternoon to all of you. Thank you for waiting. So welcome to the 100 CNE talk from School of Medicine, Massa University. So I'm Dr. Sri Rajaswari, and I will be your host, and Dr. Rose will be the host for today. So I would like to introduce the first speaker for today, Prof. Dr. Jamaluddin bin Haji Muhammad. He's the professor in pediatrics, Massa University, since September 2009. He's also the head of department. He had served in the Ministry of Health Malaysia for almost 31 years. He became pediatrician since September 1985. He retired from the Ministry of Health June 2019. His last position was head of department of pediatrics and consultant pediatrician in Hospital Sungai Buloh Selangor. He finished his, he completed his MD in USM in 1988, followed by that he did his DCH Glasgow in 1984. He completed his MRCP UK in pediatri pediatrics in 1985. He's also credentialed as specialized in advanced and general pediatrics in 2005. Previous academic and university involvements, uh, Prof. Dr. Jamaluddin, was the assistant professor in pediatrics, medical faculty in the International Islamic University of Malaysia for 11 months. He was also the adjunct lecturer in pediatrics in Alliance Medical College for about seven years. He is also the honorary adjunct professor in pediatrics in Massa University and Taylor's Medical School. He is also the honorary lecturer in pediatrics in MSU and UITM method, uh, medical faculty. And today, his title for today's talk will be HIV in children. Without further ado, I would like to invite Prof. Dr. Jamaluddin bin Haji Muhammad to um, continue with his talk. Yeah. Uh, Assalamualaikum and thank you uh, Dr. Siraja and Dr. Rose. So my topic today is HIV in children. First of all, I would like to apologize for the technical error just now, a bit delayed. So I shall present. Eh? So, so I start the next slide. Okay. Can see the slides? Yeah. Uh, and you can everyone can hear. Okay. HIV infection among children in Malaysia is estimated about one percent of total population who are living with this disease. There is around more than a thousand. Uh, patient, pediatric patient who are, has HIV, I can't, uh, I don't know the recent one, but it's at least 1,000 over, okay? So there'll be, in the, uh, it's out of the 92,000 of the to total adult population, okay? And it's estimated about 3,000 new cases of uh, HIV infected cases per annum in Malaysia, okay? HIV transmission, is through the HIV drug abuse, sexual, uh, heterosexual, MSM, vertical, especially uh, is the most uh, mode of transmission in children. Okay. Uh, the good point is that the empty, the uh, empty city or the mother to child transmission program, which was introduced way back in 1998, has um, made this a success and in 2018 the the method the trial transmission has gone almost zero okay because of this good program introduced by the ministry of health okay worldwide uh in 2021 there's uh, estimated around 160,000 of children in the world who have uh living with hiv and the total children infected is around 1.8 million. That is 4% of total adult population, which is about 38.4 million. That is people living with HIV in year 2021. However, only 54% of these children are getting treatment. 
Why? Because of they are living in the sub-Saharan region mainly and they have limited access to a good health care. That's, that's why there's 100,000 children die of HIV uh, AIDS related disease. The sub-Saharan in Africa are the main area in the world that uh, have the largest people uh, living with HIV, which account about 25.6 million. It's 66 percent of the total cases. Okay, in Malaysia, it's still a significant epidemic, and uh, it's estimated around 70 to 90 thousand of people living in HIV in Malaysia. Okay, the later I think 70 thousand three, three years ago was 72 thousand, and the uh, majority 75 percent of this population are aged between 20 to 39 years of age, which is the uh, young, okay, young age group. Children means less than 13 years old, which constitute about 1%, more than 1,000 cases, okay. And uh, since the good MTCT uh, program, the, the new cases of HIV in children is almost uh, very uh, gone down, gone down significantly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is a world uh, population showing that the main HIV patient are, are occurs in the sub-Saharan area. Okay. Followed by the in uh, Indian and sub Southeast Asia. Then followed by the Europe. Yeah, sorry, the American and the uh, Europe, okay? <sighs> okay, definition. HIV infections means uh, anyone that infected with the, with the retrovirus, whether symptomatic or asymptomatic, whereas AIDS or acquired immunodeficiency syndrome is an advanced severe form of HIV infection, which lead to very high mortality. WHO has developed HIV classification into four stages according to severity. AIDS is the clinical stage four with the presence of serious opportunistic infections. Okay, Opportunistic infections means the PCP, the, the, the pneumocystis carina pneumonia, systemic fungal viral or protozoan infections. There are three factors that need to be determined. Uh, in order for management and prognostic factor in HIV infection. First, the immunological base that is based on CD4 counts. Number two, the viral load. And number three is the clinical stage. Okay. Pathophysiology. The etiological agent is retrovirus. It's a RNA virus. It's a member of lentivirus genus. There are two types of HIV virus, HIV-1, HIV-2. This virus uh, selectively destroy the CD4 subset of T lymphocytes, which important role in the immuno defense. So as a result of this, there will be lack of CD4 and leads to opportunistic infections of rare organism and also the emergence of rare cancers. As a result, when the CD4 count uh, decrease, the viral load will increase. Okay. However, although although we have uh, the scientists have have uh, discovered or found many antiretroviral drug, but none of them are able to cure this disease. It will never have hundred percent eradication. Okay, because of certain. Uh, virus factor in this uh, HIV virus, okay. So the, so to ensure the success of the management of this prop disease, there should be a balance between the viral load and the immune defense. Okay, transmissions. Okay. Uh, as been told just now, uh, how the children get this infection is mainly through 
vertical transmission from maternal to child. A sexual transmission among children is very uh, is uh, rare, although it does occur in uh, adult, some of the adolescents, and also through blood products. Okay, and uh, rarely needle uh, to the needles. The blood products are uh, uh, was a historical time because it was way back in the 80s, 1980s, where the blood products were not screened properly. So those uh, children who are requiring blood product like hemophilia or other diseases get diseases, get this infection through the blood transfusions. Okay. Uh, the virus also can transmit during delivery and through the breast milk. There's no transmission through saliva, sweat, tears, pressure contact, sharing with utensils, swimming pool, phone, toilet seats, insect bite, etc. This must be shared to the public uh, because a lot of misconception about the transmission of this disease. Okay, so the public education is important role. That's why there is a uh, the stigma. To the patients because they have wrong concept of the transmission and they don't want to uh, mix with these patients no, HIV in terms socially okay factors associated with high transmission rate are uh, to children are low maternal cd4 count high viral load and advanced disease and also all the maternal factors that involve in the delivery okay like premature delivery, invasive procedures, electrode fetal blood sampling, animal synthesis, vaginal delivery, and rupture of membrane. This all will contribute to more risk of the fetus to get the HIV infection. That's why uh, this is uh, should be avoided uh, in delivery of HIV positive mother. And all broad blood products now are luckily been screened effectively previous compared to previously because now we have this uh, net testing, okay, nuclear acid testing where we where they have they can uh, the blood bank will be able to detect the virus even in a short uh, time eh, compared uh, because it's a window period okay so it's a more effective way of screening blood nowadays so there's a less risk of other patients who are uh, disease that require blood transfusion to get HIV the risk is now is less because of this net testing okay okay talking about maternal to child transmission uh, after an understanding those slides in order to reduce the transmission, first the anti antipartum and interperipartum HIV positive mothers should be given <laughs> adequate antiretroviral therapy, okay? Be, be, even during pregnancy or even before delivery. And now in Malaysia, I was told, yeah, all the uh, pregnant women are screened for HIV status. So we can identify which are the high risk mothers. So the HIV positive mothers, they are in order to avoid to reduce the transmission, they are they must undergo elective cesarean section and no more vaginal delivery. And there is no breastfeeding for the infant because as you know, breastfeed will increase the viral load. And uh, it's mandatory for six week therapy with zidovidin, that is the antiretroviral drug for all the newborn, uh, born uh, to all the HIV positive mothers. Even we don't know the status yet, nah? we've given all. Okay, which children that need screening? Children that need screening are infants that born to HIV positive mothers. Uh, okay. Abandoned babies, babies with mother of high risk behavior like drug addict, sex workers, multiple sex partners, and single or teenage pregnancy. Sexually abused children and children on regular blood transfusion like 
now this a thalassemia patients okay how about immunizations vaccine are generally safe and we are tol tolerated by the children and can be given according to the immunization schedule but make sure the patient is clinically stable and the cd4 count is adequate okay bcg is safe in most newborns because most of the newborns of actually possible mother are quite asymptomatic only you have to be careful is the life attenuated vaccine like mmr and varicella measles mum rubella and varicella you shouldn't be given to uh, children who have severe immunosuppression with cd4 count of less than 20 percent because these virus are not totally dead, so they can be, they can re replicate and cause the disease in this immune, immunodeficiency patients. Okay, other vaccines are relatively uh, safe: DTaP, uh, diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, influenza, influenza type B, hepatitis B, pneumococcal, and influenza. Influenza vaccine is uh, recommended to give yearly. Uh, and uh, zoster immunoglobulin should be given to HIV cases that have been exposed to chicken pox. Okay, what are the clinical features of HIV in children? Uh, they are numerous here. Lymph, uh, lymph adenopathy, that means enlargement of the lymph node, whether it's generalized or persistent. Hepatospinomegaly. Recurrent infections of the respiratory tract, skin, and ear ear infections, prolonged fever more than one month, chronic diarrhea more than two weeks, failure to thrive or poor weight gain, lethargic oral or vaginal candidiasis and developmental delay. Okay. Clinical staging WHO. WHO has staged um, uh, HIV into four stages, okay? Uh, the clinical stage one is the asymptomatic. There is no symptoms or the slightest sign is just persistent generalized lymph adenopathy. Then clinical stage two, there is the mild example like unexplained persistent hepatospinomegaly, papular pleuritic eruptions, uh, extensive viral warts, extensive molluscum contagiosum, recurrent oral ulceration, unexplained system parotid enlargement, okay, herpes zoster, recurrent URTI, fungal and nail infections. So they are mainly skin infections, huh? recurrent and also extensive. The stage three is more advanced, include the unexplained moderate malnutrition, unexplained persistent diarrhea, unexplained persistent fever in the morning and the man, persistent oral candidiasis, oral hairy leukoplakia, lymph node TB, uh, palm TB, uh, severe recurrent bacterial pneumonia or in any in severe infections, okay, even unexplained anemia and pancytopenia. Okay, clinical stage four. This is what we call AIDS, okay. Clinical stage four are the AIDS. Is where the uh, severe immunosuppression and and these are the disease that will define the AIDS. If the child got any of this disease, it will be labeled as AIDS. Okay, like an as uh, an explain wasting or severe malnutrition, pneumocystis pneumonia, recurrent severe bacterial infection, chronic herpes simplex infection, extra pulmonary TB, Kaposi sarcoma. Esophageal very candidiasis, CNS toxoplasmosis, HIV encephalopathy, CMB infection. As you can see, all these are very rare uh, organisms which causes very advanced disease. Okay, rare fungal, uh, protozoal, uh, and uh, and also certain uh, leukemia uh, tumors like uh, non Hodgkin lymphoma. Okay, and other uh, organopathy, yeah? cardiomyopathy and nephropathy, all these are rare. But these are AIDS-defined disease. 
Okay. Investigation. How do we investigate to confirm the HIV in a child? As you know, it's a bit challenging because when the newborn is born, the maternal antibody also uh, cross to the placenta and be in the child's blood. So that, that's why for those then 18 months old, uh, HIV DNA testing using PSPCR is more accurate. Okay, For those in 18 months old, then only we use the serology method uh, by the antibody. Okay, And we need uh, two or three tests to confirm the child is uh, positive. Management. Antiretroviral therapies. Okay. Uh, we need uh, major drug. Uh, we, we actually it's a multi uh, multidisciplinary management. Okay, but mainly the drug therapy. They are um, they are major. Uh, there are five major drug here. That is NRTI nucleoside reverse transcription inhibitors. NNRTI, non nucleoside reverse transcription inhibitors, protease inhibitors, okay, the and other the CCR5 antagonists and the fusion inhibitors, okay. The problem with these drugs are we cannot use them monotherapy except in the prevention of the retroviral therapy uh, for the zero within that we use for the six weeks of life for the newborns, okay. The drugs must be in combination. There is high, uh, high, uh, combi uh, you, need, you need at least three drugs, uh, three combination of three drugs, okay, from this to, to become highly antiretroviral therapy, okay. One is not enough, and this drug, uh, must be taken lifelong. There is no turn back. Okay. And and there is more challenges in children because this drug are not all in tablets. I mean, uh, children need to take the syrup form. They, some cannot tolerate tablets or capsules. So they uh, should be in, uh, they should be crushed or even uh, in the form of syrup or even the tablet, you have to crush it uh, to, to mix with the uh, fluid uh, to give them. And the dosage also uh, difficult, okay? There's a BD, TDS, and so on, okay? So that is a question of compliance uh, in these children. Okay, the categories of antiretroviral drugs already uh, mentioned is now NR in NRTR are this list: zidovudin, stavudin, lamivudin, uh, dadinosin, dinovir. Okay, and NRTI is efavirenz and uh, nevirapine. Okay, then protease inhibitors we have uh, ritonave, lapinave, ritonave. Okay, the then the CCR5 antagonists, then fusion inhibitors. Okay, this diagram shows all, how the drugs, okay, how the, the, uh, the drugs act at different level uh, to, pre to, to prevent the viral replication, okay. Uh, some goes uh, at the receptor level, some goes at the uh, DNA any level okay and so on okay but however there's no but this drug doesn't ensure cure okay the drug must be taken lifelong if the child stop the drug the viral will replicate back it will never go into zero that's the problem with this uh interview viral drug okay who to start the 
therapy, the HIV drug, okay? World Health Organization has recommend to start that all infants, children, and adolescents who are HIV positive, regardless of the clinical staging and CD4 count. Before that, there was many other indication, but now it's better to start all in any stage, okay? And there's no more, there's no more monotherapy except in the prophylaxis of the MTCT program that is given the Zydo within for the first six weeks of life. As I mentioned just now, heart is a highly active antiretroviral therapy which consists of three different class of drug that is given lifelong. And we have to, for this patient, when they're on drug, they must be clinical, uh, by, they should be monitored by the clinical CD4 count and viral load level, okay? Viral load is through the HIV DNA to uh, PCR testing, okay? If the treatment is effective, then the viral load should decline and the CD4 count should improve. To ensure this, uh, the patient must comply and adhere to the drug regime because non-compliance will to the drug will lead to the emergence of the resistance strain of the virus and this is more troublesome because once the drug is resistant okay uh, the, 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 the the doctor has to uh, start a new combination uh, new combination of drug Totally three out and another three drugs has to be uh, started. Okay. And apart from the cost, uh, the cost of the drug um, and the palatability for children, in adolescent, there are also issues with adherence and with medication because as you know, adolescents are more uh, resistant. They don't want, uh, they want to have change. Uh, they, so, there is issues in adherence when the patient goes to, to adolescence. Of course, intercurrent infection like tuberculosis, meningitis, or other bacteria, serious infections should be also tracked, should be treated with the other antibiotics. So the goal of therapy is to, re to decrease the viral load, to improve the immune system. That is the evidence for the increase in the CD4 count and improve quality of life and survival, optimizing growth and development, and finally to reduce opportunity infections. This will make the uh, prolonged life survival. Okay, I already mentioned this now, there's no cure to this infection. The drug must be taken lifelong, and uh, if there is uh, non-compliance, emergence of the resistance stain and this drug must be taken lifelong okay of course in order to prevent the pneumocystis uh, carinae or gyrovisai pneumonia all HIV cases should be started with co-trimazole to, pre to prevent these infections okay Okay, for the management of the newborn, if you remember just now, all the HIV positive mother must be delivered in the hospital through the elective cesarean section. The newborn must be admitted to the natal ward and, uh, and uh, given formula feeding. There's no breastfeeding is allowed at all. Of course, while in the ward, the baby are uh, screened for any congenital anomalies. Any withdrawal symptoms if the mother is a uh, drug addict and so on, and blood taking for the basic testing uh, for blood count, LFT, and other uh, screening tests. The, the, the HIV DNA uh, PCR uh, is taken, is also taken, okay? And uh, the zero, zero within started for the six weeks. And the baby started with PC prophylaxis that is co-tramazole through the HIV status is determined. 
all these newborn should have three PCR taken, okay? One at newborn and follow up later at uh, uh, six weeks of life and four to six months old. We only confirm the baby is HIV negative if all the three PCR are negative. Then only we confirm that this baby is free from HIV. Okay. And then we can stop the PCP prophylaxis that is the cotramazole. If the PCR show positive, then the baby is confirmed HIV positive. Then the baby has to start the antiretroviral therapy and the cotramazole is continued. Huh? And the baby is referred to the pediatric infectious disease specialist for lifelong management. Okay. When to start, so it's recommended all HIV positive as early as possible. Okay. There is uh, now there's no priority to who. It's better to start everyone. Okay. To ensure the long term uh, good prognosis. But before we start the antiretroviral drug, the caregivers or the or the uh, or the parents uh, should be counseled about the importance of compliance and adherence to this drug because there's no turning back. If they don't follow this regime, this uh, adherence or compliance, there'll be more trouble because. Uh, the emergence of resistance strains and we have to if that happened then they have to use new set of drugs okay although uh, giving drugs to children is quite um, challenging in terms of the palatability and the rigid regimes and the, so but they have to endure this they have to ensure it uh they must follow the regime okay okay so uh, this example how you give combination of three drugs group okay two nrti plus one nrti or two nrti plus one pi for example a child of 12 more than 12 years old was give, given a zidovidin Z, uh, zdv plus three tc that is uh lamivudin uh, plus lopinave, okay, uh, or ABC plus TCC plus lopinave, or TDF plus FTC, okay, lopinave, lopinave, yeah. For the effervescence, that is the NNRTI is used for more than three years old, and for the maybe rapid can use for the less than three years old, okay. But now, of course, ideally we have if you have uh, we have a uh, drug which have uh, one tablet or have two or three formulation that is more ideal okay and uh, now we have this convivial that is uh, two drugs in one tablet so that is better palatability okay that is contain lamivudin and zidovudin okay so the child doesn't have to take too many tablets or Drug, okay, we have already uh, combined. You see the CD4 count according to age. CD4 count in, in, in children is difficult, okay, because uh, in, to interpret it, it, you have to know the age because it will tell you at what age and we should have mild, moderate, or severe immunodeficiency, okay. Generally, if less than 15% is under severe immunodeficiency, probably they're going to the eighth category, okay? This one will, this chart is important to see the immuno, uh, I mean the immuno state, immunodeficiency states and help the clinician to, mon to monitor the therapy, okay? And the, and the management, okay? Okay, fol the follow-up. The aim of the antiretroviral drug is to achieve undetectable viral load. If possible, less than 50 copies per 
mil and a good CD4 count. Okay, that is the end. Uh, this ensure a clinically stable and the patient will be free from the infections. Okay, the follow up will be three to four monthly. And every follow up, you ask about adherence and side effect of the drugs. Okay, monitor the growth and development of the child and see any evidence of opportunity infections. Uh, every visit should take the full blood count, CD4 counts, viral load tests. Genotyping resistant testing if there, if there is a suspect of uh, resistance. Okay. And also, other things that you have to explore is the psychological and financial problem because, as we know, these HIV patients, they are generally poor because uh, they are from, uh, because half of them has lost their parents due to this disease, or maybe the parents are not working because of the hiv is a stigma so there is a lack of job and so there's a lot of uh, financial problem in these families okay and the the children who are orphans were taken care by the other family members like grandparents or even uh, adopted or under ngo care they won't have a proper <coughs> I mean, um, care, okay, in terms of compliance with the drug, okay. And there's a need to, to refer to social welfare for financial aid, transportation, and so on, okay. And uh, this is a not notifiable disease, okay. Uh, uh, the clinicians are supposed to notify within one week of diagnosis. All other family members should also be screened, okay. In terms of disclosure of the HIV status, <coughs> Okay, of course, the child, no, we shouldn't dis, uh, tell the, in a young child about the why, what disease they have. But when the child is older enough, they should be told about their HIV condition and status, okay? The, the news must be break, okay? And then when you go to adolescent, they need counseling in terms of uh, peer, sexual health and pregnancy, okay? and the plan to transfer to adult care services when they they go into adulthood after adolescence okay other issues in hiv is this stigma okay the, uh, generally the hiv status it should be only uh confide to the uh, caretaker and not and not and should be minimal nobody else should know about this okay the school is optional. Shouldn't the school teacher the shouldn't have shouldn't know, and relative members shouldn't know because there'll be a lot of stigmatization stigmatization for the child if if there's no this child has positive okay a lot of negative impact because of the stigma that uh, stigma thing okay and we, we need the NGO to provide psychological and financial support. In Malaysia, we have Malaysian AIDS Council, but last time they used to give uh, money for these children to go to hospital, but now I think there is the fund is limited. Okay, it should be multidisciplinary approach, and in and there's a limited option of antiretroviral drugs available here in Malaysia because not all drugs are easily import they're quite expensive but we're still lucky because most of the children that 1000 over as you know just now in the previous in the earlier slide most of the children are follow followed by the pediatric infectious diseases or pediatrician and most of them have a drug coverage okay compared to the sub-saharan uh, region okay i just got a few slides to show this uh child with molluscum contagiosum okay it's quite extensive of the skin is all hiv patients okay this the child with oral candidiasis especially if the oral candidiasis is recurrent and extensive we have to think hiv uh, about breastfeeding controversies okay of course in malaysia we can afford to say no breastfeeding for hiv positive uh, mother okay we 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 uh we give them 
formula feeding. Okay, no breastfeeding at all. But but this controversy in the third world country, uh, in like in Africa, where as you know, breast milk is important to provide some immunity against pneumonia, AGE, and the, and to prevent serious infections. Okay, where there is a where the country there is a, a, a poor resource country, breastfeeding is still allowed. Okay, because uh, that is to save life. Huh? Those were uh, country which have. Uh, uh, Rich, they can uh, uh, have uh, this uh, protocol. Okay, I think that is the uh, end of my uh, talk. Uh, is there any questions? I don't know how they can ask. Is it to the chat? Okay. Anyway, thank you for attention. Yeah. Thank you very much, Prof. Dr. Jamaluddin, for the informative lecture. Yes, we do have a question here. Yeah, Prof, can you? The question is um, on the screen. Yeah. Yeah, this is this question from uh, Prof Razak, is it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. I'm not. I'm not really, really exactly sure about the adult management, but yeah. If the, the surely all the uh, because the the, the um, uh, all the HIV positive mother are treated with heart yes yeah they refer to the infection disease specialist yeah they also been treated uh, regardless of the cd4 count because that is better because we don't want to wait for opportunity infection to happen that's why they start early okay before the person go into in uh, opportunity infection they they start the drug therapy early and there's uh, and the number of positive uh, HIV positive mother are not that many because as you know 90% uh, of the adult are uh, in the male huh? the female only 10% that is to the heterosexual contact and there will be no issue in uh, in terms of um, cost effectiveness so there will be no problem in treating the uh, mothers with HIV with the heart therapy. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Um, I think that's the only question. So thank you very much. I yeah, will well, move on to our thank you, Prof. All right, without further ado, I would like to move on to our second speaker for today. Our second speaker for today will be Dr. Sh Associate Professor Dr. Shia Zaman Safi. A little introduction about um, Prof. Safi. Okay. His research interests lie primarily in the area of biomedicine, molecular cell biology, biotechnology, and biochemistry. His current research focuses on the understanding of molecular alteration and epigenetic modification in several human diseases. Previously, he worked on virology and immunology during his Master of Philosophy research at National University of Science and Technology. At University of Malaya, his research involved in the examination of beta adrogenic receptor signaling in diabetic complications. He also investigated the effects of agonists and also antagonists of beta receptors in hyperglycemic retinal and Mueller cells. At National University of Singapore, he, 
His experiments dealt with evaluation of phosphorylation of genes involving inflammatory pathway of hypoglycemic HUVEC. At Ejo University, South Korea, he worked on the epigenetic of degenerative diseases. He worked on some other short-term projects in Germany, Australia, China, and China. During his postdoctoral period, he worked on various projects as co-investigator. He investigated the effects of glum honey on oxidative stress-induced signaling in hamster cells and SDZ-induced diabetic rats. He also worked on a project, ROS production and cell membrane potential in hypoglycemic endothelial cells. During his tenure as assistant professor before joining Massa University, he secured five international and several, seven national grants. Dr. Safi has published his research in a range of reputed journals, including Lancet, and has a cumulative impact factor of more than 800. He has presented his research in many international conferences and symposia. He has been the winner of prestigious awards and scholarships such as Bright Spark Scholarship and excellent awards during PhD and Young Scientist Travel Awards. So um, the title for today's talk will be Epigenetic and Molecular Mechanism of Diabetes. So I would like to welcome Associate Professor Dr. Safi. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sri. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, yes, Prof. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you for uh, your introduction. And I would like to straight away go to my talk. Uh, the title of my talk is Epigenetics and Molecular Mechanisms of Diabetes. Um, I'm sure you all know about diabetes. Uh, <clears throat> I won't take a lot, um, you know, a lot of discussion on this uh, because I, I I believe you all know uh, what is type 1 diabetes and what is type 2 diabetes. But briefly, I would say uh, type 1 diabetes, uh, in type 1 diabetes, um, you know, the insulin is not produced because of the uh, immune cells attack the pancreatic cells uh, which produce insulin, but in type 2 diabetes, the insulin is less and the body becomes resistant. Um, similarly, 95% uh, cases are type 2 diabetes, but uh, only 5% are type 1 diabetes. So type 2 is more prevalent than type 1. Um, I would like to actually uh, talk more about epigenetics because um, number one, it's uh, an emerging field. Uh, number two, it's very interesting because uh, it's emerging field. So it is, uh, you know, every day you will hear something new about epigenetics. Uh, and what is epigenetics? It is actually uh, the manipulation of genes uh, uh, without changing the sequence of the DNA. You, you all know about, um, you know, genetics, but in genetics, uh, uh, actually the sequence of DNA is changed. Um, <clears throat> sorry, you all know about the mutations. So all those mutations actually occur through changes in the sequence of DNA. But in epigenetics, although it also has a name of genetics, uh, it is quite different than, uh, than genetics. Here, the sequence of the DNA remain same, uh, but it actually manipulated the functioning of the gene. So if we simply uh, or briefly uh, define the epigenetics, uh, it means that it has a role in turning on and turning off the genes. Because you know, in our body, there are more than 50,000 genes. And all those genes cannot be regulated 24 hours. Uh, they need to be stopped because once the protein uh, threshold is completed, uh, they has to be stopped. And sometimes they need to stop for a longer while. Sometimes they need to produce protein for a longer while. So every gene has to uh, be turned off and every gene has to be turned on uh, whenever it is needed. So we can say that epigenetics is sort of, uh, it is a switch on 
in off decanism. Uh, here uh, you can see on the left side that when the gene is not methyl, it is demethylated. So the gene expression is turned on. But when a methyl group is attached to the promoter of the gene, uh, the transcription factor cannot attach to the promoter of that gene and hence the gene expression is turned off. So you need to remember two things. When the gene is demethylated, it is switched on. And when it, when it is methylated, it is switched off. So this is how genes are regulated. Uh, as I said earlier, that uh, the sequence is not changed in epigenetics. So here you can see it is a genetic change. And here you can see end state of G, we have T. So the T, there is a mutation. There is one mutation here in this DNA. And this DNA is totally mutated. So definitely we will expect a different function, a different protein. But here we have, in case of epigenetics, we don't expect to change the sequence of the DNA. It will just attach a tag. That could be methylation, that could be acetylation, that could be some other changes. So this small tag actually change the behavior of the gene. So that's why it is known as epigenetics. And uh, there are three major types of epigenetics. Um, number one, gene methylation, uh, in which a methyl group is attached to the promoter of the gene. Um, then we have um, histone modification. And histone modification, usually acetylation occur. Amethylation also occur. But the most uh, prevalent type is DNA methylation. We also have non-coding RNA. Um, and non-coding RNAs are actually those RNAs uh, which, uh, you know, they don't have to code for protein. But they help to regulate the, those, those genes which are coding for protein. So they are non-coding, they cannot produce protein, but they help the coding proteins, the coding genes to produce, uh, you know, protein. So these three mechanisms are uh, most uh, important. And among these three, DNA methylation is the most interesting and studied mechanism. So I will also, uh, focus a bit uh, on DNA methylation. So I hope you all know about what is gene. <clears throat> Here we can see that it is a cell. And inside cell, we have a number of chromosomes which are located inside the nucleus. So these chromosomes are actually the coiled form of DNA. The DNA is actually uh, Compact, uh, compacted into this uh, form. Uh, because it's too long, uh, it cannot be commutated in a small nucleus. So it is compacted into these shapes called chromosome. But if we open this DNA, so it will look like this. And here you can see that, that a small segment of this DNA, this long DNA has so many genes. And every segment, of this DNA is known as gene. And what is gene? Gene is a particular part of DNA which perform a different function. For example, the hair color is controlled by a specific gene and that is a small fragment of DNA. So that's why we call it gene. Uh, here I would like to briefly explain how epigenetics work in gene regulation. You can see here, it's a binding site. And a binding site is always a promoter of a gene. And promoter is a part of their gene which actually regulate the expression, which actually regulate the turning on and turning off of their gene. So here you can see in green color, a transcription factor is going to attach to this binding site. And once this transcription factor is bind to this binding site, the gene is regulated. The gene is expressed and we call it 
the protein is formed. So this is called turning on of a gene, right? Be because without attaching the transcription factor, a gene cannot produce a protein. Binding of transcription factor to the binding side of the promoter is very, very crucial. So now let's see the same figure when it gets methylated. So here you can see the same figure, but on the binding side, we got methyl group attached. And now the transcription factor don't have any landing uh, sequence where it can land. And when it has no landing site, so the protein, uh, sorry, the gene cannot produce a protein because the transcription factor don't have a space to land on. And because of that, the gene is switched off. So this is how a transcription factor and methylation or, or epigenetics play a role in the regulation of a gene. How epigenetic changes are induced? Uh, it's, it's, it's a question and it is a question which has so many answers and every day a new thing is developed and introduced. Uh, but until now, epigenetics are believed to be induced by environment it could be your lifestyle, your physical exercise, smoking, drugs, and uh, also food intake. The food we take uh, actually uh, can induce changes in the epigenetics of a person. I'm giving this example because I just want to explain that how environment can change the epigenetics of a person or, or animals. So here you can see a rate, of, uh, sorry, a mouse. And this mouse on the left side, the yellow color mouse, it is, it is called a booty mouse, okay? So now if a parent of these, actually these two mouses looks quite different, but they are produced from the same line, they are, having the same age and they are genetically identical to mice. But why they are different? When the mother of this yellow was fed, was fed with the, with, with the normal diet. Normal diet means when a normal diet is consumed by the agouti mice, it will produce a yellow coat mice and it will be very obvious and will be healthy and it will be prone to cancer. But in 2000, um, uh, 2003, uh, Randy and Waterland experimented a very, very exciting uh, experiment. And uh, they fed the same mother, the same yellow coat mother with the methyl donating food that was supplements, folic acids, and you know, uh, vitamin B12, etc. And surprisingly, the same time pregnant um, uh, mice produced two different mice. And this was thin, it was more healthy, and the color was more, more brown. So the life expectancy of these two were different. Although they are genetically same, and one is quite big, obvious actually it is obesity and the other is healthy and with um, darker color so this is how environment or food choices can change your epigenetics and as a result uh, you can have uh, different phenotypes um, nowadays you know the the skin care industry is also focusing more on the on the epigenetics uh, because uh, uh, identical twins, uh, it is proved by research that identical twins um, can have different skin color or skin uh, texture uh, based on the methylation and ion methylation uh, levels. So uh, nowadays they are actually targeting uh, to, to, to boost or change the epigenetics of skin. And this is how uh, this industry is going to go forward. How epigenetics and heritability are 
associated. So it is actually uh, uh, not a very confirmed um, answer to this question, whether epigenetic is hereditable, but it is believed and uh, in some studies it is already proven that if a mother is smoking, she actually, if, if a mother is pregnant and she's smoking, actually she is um, uh, changing the epigenetics of three generations. One uh, of his own and second, uh, the baby uh, which he is carrying. And third, the, the, the reproductive cells of the baby which, uh, which is carried by her. So it's, it's changing the generation of uh, actually three, three, changing the epigenetics of three generations. So now what is good and what is bad and what is ugly? I mean, the question is whether epigenetics is good or epigenetics is bad. So again, it is, it is a complex question and uh, there is no straightforward answer to that. But we can say there are good. And what is good? The good is when, 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 when a zygote or uh, you know, a small baby is uh, in growth stage, these modifications actually uh, produce different types of cells. The heart is formed with a different type of cell. Liver is, uh, you know, uh, developed differently, and all the organs are actually differentiated into 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 a different way. And that is that is the beauty of this uh, of these modification. But when we look at the bare side, there are so many. For example, I will just quote cancer. Uh, there are so many um, cancer suppressing cells. Uh, sorry, genes. There are genes which actually we call um, suppressor genes. They suppress the cancer. But when methylation occur on those genes, they are switched off. And it's like um, uh, all the defense was destroyed by a switching off the genes which actually are anti-cancer. So, and the ugly is sometimes there are changes, there are genetic changes in the machinery of the epigenetics. So the epigenetics where it, it, it regulate, it regulates the epigenetic changes, they itself changed um, uh, you know, genetically. And that is the worst thing to happen because that is not reversible. The other thing can be reversed. Methylation can be increased or methylation can be reduced but in that case uh, it is i think i think the ugliest um, phase of epigenetics how diabetes and epigenetics uh, correlate actually again it is very complex and this field is also emerging so there is less clarity but there are so many factors which are associated with with each other Exercise can affect your epigenome. Okay, your diet can affect your epigenome, and that epigenome can affect your obesity, and that epigenome can induce your type two diabetes. And similarly, if you have obesity, that obesity can also induce type two diabetes. I won't go into a lot of details. Uh, but I would share that there has been a tremendous research in, in, in epigenetics. Um, most of the research conducted on the obesity, uh, they targeted blood and they targeted adipose tissues in, 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 in obese people. They targeted uh, skeletal muscles. And uh, you can see the number and the names of the genes which they found uh, apparently, um, uh, uh, you know, the methylation level was different than normal. So these are the genes which are playing roles in all these tissues uh, specific of uh, obesity. Similarly, in type 2 diabetes, um, most of the research was directed to pancreatic isolate cells. Uh, there was research on blood cells. There was research 
on the liver cells, adipose tissues, and skeletal muscles. And again, you can see that there are a number of genes which are involved. But this number is quite less, as I already mentioned that there are more than 50,000 genes. And 50,000 genes in every uh, organ or every tissue, investigating them in, in all these tissues will take some time. So I would now come to some of uh, the highlights um, I have, and I did some research on the genetics of 81 gene. Uh, ET1 gene is actually, it is endothelin 1 um, and it is uh, a potent uh, vasoconstrictor gene. And it also has a role in endothelial dysfunction, which is uh, induced by diabetes. So it's sort of diabetes induced uh, um, endothelial dysfunction because the hubic cells were uh, stimulated by glucose. So to mimic diabetes, we induce those human umbilical van endothelial cells with glucose. And uh, this gene also has a role in uh, fibrosis, uh, vascular cells, and it stimulates the production of reactive oxygen species in diabetes. So <clears throat> because of its involvement in the endothelial dysfunction and diabetes, uh, we wanted to check its methylation level uh, in uh, human umbilical van endothelial cells, which were treated with glucose to mimic diabetes. So this is the gene actually, and this is the promoter part. On the left, you can see the promoter part. And uh, on the right is the coding sequence. The coding sequence is the sequence which actually produce protein. But on the left is uh, the promoter side, promoter side actually is the regulator of this, the switching on and switching off of this gene is done by the promoter side. So definitely we had to look uh, to the promoter side to see the methylation because methylation usually after a promoter side. So we selected a 400 base pair uh, sequence uh, from the primer, which extended minus 220 base pair to plus 180 base pair. And we identified this location and this sequence and designed the primers, the, the, the reverse and forward primers. And through that, we conducted uh, the methylation studies. Um, I, I, I cannot share all the, uh, all the methodology because it's quite lengthy. Um, and then we conducted uh, MTT assay. Uh, because we, as I said, we treated these cells with uh, glucose and we just wanted to see, to see whether glucose induced uh, cell death or not. And here we can see that uh, cells with low glucose are more healthy, but cells with high glucose, they are not healthy and there is uh, more apoptosis. They, the, the, the live cells in those which were treated with high glucose were less in number. That means they died due to the exposure of the glucose. So it was confirmed that what we wanted to mimic a diabetic condition, we were successful. Um, definitely we had to check the expression because as I mentioned, the expression of a gene is always associated with the level of methylation. If methylation is more, the expression will be less. If the methylation is less, the expression will be more. So hence it is directly associated with the methylation level. So we had to check the gene expression. And here we can see that high glucose induced the expression of ET1 gene. So once we can, we can once we check uh, the expression, we can actually predict the, the amount of methylation. Because if the expression is increasing, that means there is methylation is reducing, okay? We were expecting the same, because now we will see whether our um, hypothesis were correct or not. 
We also did to, to measure the reactive oxygen species through DCFH air um, assay, and here was the results that uh, uh, reactive oxygen species were, were increased in high glucose, and it was definitely uh, has to happen. Uh, and this is our uh, actual results. And here we can see that we did not notice any significant difference in methylation in those cells which were treated with high glucose and those cells which were treated with low glucose. And the conclusion is that it did not play a role. The methylation is not supposed to always play a role in the expression of a gene or the switching off and the switching on of a gene. It is not mandatory that every gene will be controlled by methylation. So here we reported that this gene actually has nothing to do with methylation and its expression is actually independent of uh, methylation. And this result, these results were published uh, this year in, in a good journal. Then I would briefly talk about the molecular biology uh, of diabetes and the molecular crosstalk in diabetes. Um, you may all know uh, about the beta adrenergic receptors. They are actually subtypes of GPCR. GPCRs are G, uh, G, uh, G receptor, uh, G protein coupled receptors. And uh, they are a family of proteins which are embedded in the membrane uh, and they perform a, a, a number of functions um, uh, in you know in signaling a lot of um, uh, signaling a lot of mm, you know uh, signaling from the from the outside of the cell into the cells through signaling and through um, ligand and receptor uh, association. So the major three types of beta energetic receptor are beta 1, beta 2, and beta 3. And we have to target all these uh, receptors. Um, we actually uh, wanted to check these uh, in different diabetic complications. And the diabetic complications which were uh, major in, in our opinion were beta cell dysfunction, uh, diabetic neuropathy, uh, diabetic retinopathy, endothelial dysfunction. So all these four conditions were evaluated with four different uh, types of cells. And uh, I will briefly go through uh, how, how we managed to, to find uh, some significant results. So this is how beta energetic receptor function uh, epinephrine or uh, not epinephrine which function as ligand they attach to the receptor and the receptor actually uh, activate uh, the subunits of the beta adrenergic receptors and which actually activate adenylate cyclase and the function of that is to activate CAMP and once CAMP which is second messenger is activated it activates PKA pathway, and PKA pathway actually is associated with CRIP and FE1. So we, I'm showing this because we went through this uh, pathway, we determined PKA, we checked CRIP. So let's see. Uh, the study plan was um, we choose a relevant cells. Beta cell dysfunction was validated in pancreatic isolate cells. Uh, diabetic neuropathy was um, was studied in molar cells and diabetic retinopathy was studied in uh, human retinal endothelial cells, HREC, and uh, endothelial dysfunction was evaluated using human umbilical van endothelial cells. And to explore the exact molecular mechanism, these glucose and non glucose treated cells were treated with different agonists and antagonists. So, here I will mention. Uh, that Zematrol uh, was one agonist, isopretinol was another uh, agonist, and Salmetrol was another one. 
So all these three were actually antagonists, uh, sorry, agonists, which actually activated or stimulated the beta adrenergic receptor. But we also kept one uh, propranolol, uh, which was actually a non beta adrenergic receptor specific um, uh, antagonist as, as, a, as a control, you can say. So three were agonist and one was antagonist. This was briefly the study plan and uh, methodology. We followed different types of techniques. Um, and here in, in the first one was pancreatic isolate cells. And here we culture the cells in normal and high glucose as I stated earlier that cells were treated with normal glucose and high glucose. And the objective was to check the REF1 and PDX1 gene because these two genes are very instrumental in promoting the survival of cells and maintenance of normal insulin secretion. So we wanted to check these two genes, what happens to these two genes. And definitely, first of all, we have to check um, you know, the apoptosis, whether the cells treated with the glucose actually working or not. So it was a confirmation that yes, the cells which were treated with glucose, they actually killed those cells, the apoptosis was high, but surprisingly, those, the stimulation of these um, uh, beta adrenergic receptor, uh, again, uh, you know, reduce the apoptosis level. So it was damaged by the glucose, but when we treated those cells with these uh, uh, stimulator beta adrenergic receptors, the apoptosis was reversed. Means the cell death was reversed. So it was interesting for us and uh, it was interesting for us to go behind REF1 and PDX1 because they are the genes which are responsible for the survival. So here we uh, conducted uh, Western blotting and uh, the expression of REF1 and PDX1 was increased by the stimulation. That means these were the guys who actually were promoted. They were upregulated by the stimulation of beta adrenergic receptor stimulation. Okay, so REF1 and PD1, uh, PDX1 expression was high when we checked, uh, when we uh, stimulated the cells with um, these uh, agonists. And uh, this is the conclusion uh, of uh, um, this uh, study, stimulation of beta adrenergic receptors significantly induced F1 and PDX1 genes with improved insulin levels and reduced apoptosis. And this was again published uh, in a good journal. And next we wanted to check CMP response element. That is CREP and we also wanted to check the survival gene that is BDNF, very important gene. We also wanted to check APF1 and cytochrome C, caspase 3 uh, in molar cells. But as uh, I described before, we wanted to check whether, um, whether the glucose is reducing the apoptosis or increasing the apoptosis. So yes, here you can see glucose is increasing the apoptosis, but when we treat them with these uh, agonists, uh, with the stimulation of these beta adrenergic receptors, the apoptosis or the cell death is reduced. So now we will again go how this apoptosis is reduced because of the stimulation of beta adrenergic receptor. Because beta adrenergic receptor are located on the uh, membrane, they itself don't do it. They do it through other pathways and we wanted to find those pathways. So here we can see there are two major pathways, intrinsic pathway and extrinsic pathway. In intrinsic pathway, we, uh, we, are, we are having cytochrome C and we are having mitochond uh, mitochondrial uh, DNA and other uh, caspase 9 and FEF1. But in extrinsic pathway, we are having caspase 8 and caspase 3, 6 and 7. So we wanted to check, give a touch to both the pathways. And here we actually um, wanted to check caspase add because we doubted that it might be caspase add which is doing this change. But 
uh, surprisingly, Caspers 8 uh, did not alter. And uh, after that, we, we, we treated the cells with TNF, TNF alpha. If they can again change the um, Caspers 8, but again, there was no change. Um, then we returned to Caspers 3 and uh, uh, we found the culprit. It was actually through Caspers 3. Here you can see that glucose is increasing the expression of Caspers 3, but when it is stimulated, the Caspers 3 is reduced, and hence the less apoptosis, the reduction in apoptosis was actually controlled by the Caspers 3. And similarly, we also checked cytochrome C release, and cytochrome C release was also reduced by the stimulation of beta adrenergic receptors. And uh, as mentioned, that PKA is important. So we went against um, behind PKA, and PKA pathway was found involved because when it is treated with glucose, the PKA was reduced, but when it was stimulated the PKA expression was highly increased. And hence we, we concluded that it is done, it is, it is controlled through PKA pathway. Similarly, BDNF was also involved and BDNF expression was increased upon the stimulation. Um, beta adrenergic receptor activate BDNF independent of CRIC. Because CRIP is a transcription factor, as I mentioned, so we wanted whether BDNF is controlled by CRIP or some other transcription factor. So we actually blocked the CRIP through SHRNA. And after blocking, we found that BDNF is still working. So we concluded that it activates BDNF independent of CRIP. And again, we published this into a good journal, and I would like to finish my talk because it will get a bit lengthy. So the next uh, we, we, we conducted human retinal endothelial cells. I cannot go into details. Um, so I will just uh, mention that in this study, we determined the promoter methylation of the subtypes of beta adrenergic receptors. And the objective was to assess the effect of hyperglycemia on promoter methylation and to correlate that extent of methylation to the expression of beta adrenergic receptor. And uh, um, this, we concluded that um, beta-1 and beta-3 adrenergic receptor are expressed in human retinal endothelial cells. Ox oxidative stress and apoptosis are inversely proportional. And uh, uh, collectively, this study may help in understanding the pathophysiology of diabetic retinopathy. Um, this was again published. And the last part was uh, human retinal endothelial cells from eyes of human. And uh, here we wanted to check NFKPB and whether it play a role in inflammation of the apoptosis. So we uh, concluded in this part that um, the beta adrenergic receptor stimulation exert a positive effect by lowering the level of inflammatory cytokines, apoptosis, adhesion molecules, and ROS generation. The effect of beta adrenergic receptor uh, agonist appears to involve, uh, to, to involve activation of beta adrenergic receptor, uh, elevation of intracellular CMP, and then lead to the suppression of inflammatory response by NF kappa B and I kappa B in hyperglycemic human umbilical van endothelial cells. So this was again published, and uh, uh, that's all. Uh, if you have any question. Um, I would be pleased to answer. Thank you, Prof. Dr. Safi. I think there isn't any question. Okay. So okay, let me just check the chat box. Yeah, I think this isn't any question. Thank you for the very informative. Uh, talk and also sharing all your research. All right, so we have come to the end. Okay, so, all right, so now yeah, I can close we, it. Yeah, just hold on, Prof. So we have come okay. to the end of today's session. So I would like to thank Prof. Dr. Jamaluddin and also Associate Prof. Safi for taking your time 
to speak at our 100 CME talk today, all right? So it was a very pleasure to have both of you with us and we hope you enjoyed the experience as much as we did. And also I would like to thank all the participants for today's CME talk and I hope to see all of you in our next CME session. So thank you everyone. Yeah, thank you.